This episode is brought to you by Zscaler. To accelerate digital transformation and win on the cyber battlefield, public sector organizations at every level are employing the power of zero trust. On March 8th, Zscaler and leading government, education, and industry experts will come together to separate zero trust fact from fiction at the first ever Zscaler Public Sector Summit. They'll explore practical ideas to strengthen cyber resiliency and fortify system networks and missions. You'll walk away with new insights to eliminate your attack surface, streamline access to applications, and meet government cyber compliance mandates. Come experience the future of public sector secured. Visit zscaler.com federal to save your seat today. Welcome to CyberCast, decoding today's cyber issues. I'm Alexander Bolova, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research, in this episode, we're going to talk through cyber trends to look out for in 2023. Joining me today are the hosts of CyberCast, Deputy Editor Kate Macri, Senior Researcher Sarah Seibert, and Staff Writer Researcher Nikki Henderson. Thank you all for joining me. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. For any new listeners to CyberCast, welcome. Kate, Sarah, and Nikki can you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you cover here at GovCIO Media and Research? I'm Kate Macri. I'm Deputy Editor at GovCIO Media and Research. I cover defense IT and cybersecurity. I'm Sarah Seibert. I'm a senior researcher with GovCIO Media and Research. I primarily cover the Department of Veterans Affairs, but also occasionally FDA, IRS, uh, some defense news here and there, and kind of all over, but primarily uh, VA. I'm Nikki Henderson. I'm a staff writer and researcher at GovCI Media and Research, and I cover health and civilian agencies as well as Department of Homeland Security. And I'm Alexander Bolova. My coworkers call me Alex. I am the production lead at GovCIO Media Research, and I am responsible for editing all of our podcasts and videos. Before we jump into the episode, Kate, Sarah, and Nikki, I've got a trivia question for you. What year was the computer invented? This is like 18 something, right? Ada Lovelace? Lovelace? Oh, wow. Or is she going to get. Uh, Sorry, did she like invent the idea of the computer, but not actually like create the first computer? I don't know. I think it was 1860, 70 something. I don't know. Sometime in the mid 1800s or maybe the 40s, 1840s. I don't I don't know. Somewhere around in there. I'm going to say maybe like 19 in the 1930s, maybe. Oh, man, mine's really, mine's like 100 years after Kate. What are we justifying or like terming a computer? Because I know like cameras, I don't know. I'll, I'll go with uh, 1980. Nope, 50, 1950. <laughs> well, it turns out Googling when was the computer invented is a lot more complicated than you would think. I'm not the researcher in the group, so I didn't go on a deep dive. But when you first Google it, it says that 1943 was the year, according to computerhistory.org, uh, the ENIAC computing system was built at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. However, if you scroll down, you get in 1822, Charles Babbage conceptualized and began developing the difference engine. Um, that's from computerhope.com. But then if you keep going down the list, like I Googled, when was the computer invented? But then I say, what year was the personal computer invented? That was in 1974. And that was a small firm named MITS, uh, a personal computer, the Altair. And that's from Britannica.com. But then you go down just slightly further. And 1975 is the year that's brought up. So my pocket computer is not particularly helpful in deciphering when the computer was invented. But needless to say, we've been living with computers for a long time now, and their ubiquity has only grown. But 
With our increased reliance on these technologies, particularly within remote environments, the need for cyber secure systems and practices has never been more important. Last year alone saw more than a billion dollars in ransomware payments, if I, my memory serves me correct. Quick editor's note, my memory did not serve me correctly. That was the number for 2021. Oops, still a lot of money. And countless cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. But things aren't all doom and gloom. More and more cyber best practices are becoming widely adopted. Software bill of materials, hybrid cloud, zero trust. It may sound like tech jargon to some, but we believe these are laying the foundation for a more cyber secure future. So today we're looking back at some of the most notable cybersecurity trends of 2022 and how they're going to shape cybersecurity going into 2023. Let's start with a review of the year in cyber news. Any events you want to highlight? So I think the three top cyber stories in 2022 centered around zero trust and culture which includes relationship building like with industry and other government agencies and then also like workforce training and culture. And then the third one would be ransomware. And I think that was still a pretty big trend in 2022, even though it was also a trend in 2021, because as you just said, there was more than a billion dollars in ransomware payments in 2021. And that's only continuing in 2022. And we expect that to continue into 2023 as well. Sarah, based on what you have covered over the last year in cybersecurity, within like zero trust, what were some interesting takeaways with that story? So the first thing that comes to my mind in terms of zero trust comes out of VA. Uh, CISO Lynette Sherrill actually developed VA's new zero trust first cybersecurity strategy, which focuses on the human perspective of security. During a Gov Focus with GovCIO Media and Research, she discussed how VA is adopting new architectures like Zero Trust to better secure veteran data, and then also discussed how they are integrating Zero Trust into the workforce mindset. We have revamped our entire cybersecurity strategy around the Zero Trust First strategy and um, really patterned after our CIO's new vision and mission for the organization to bring excellence in every area of IT. Um, specifically in the Zero Trust, we are bringing cybersecurity excellence to with an engineering principle behind it so that we can make sure that our strategy is sound and that we have a, a solid roadmap to go forward. We're also working to change the mindset and the culture of the organization so that people understand that zero trust first is, is a completely different mindset. It's a different framework than we're used to. Um, we're used to more perimeter-based cybersecurity. And this brings that perimeter-based security down to each system and giving us a lot more protection of our assets um, as we as we begin to roll this out. Nikki, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of Zero Trust? Well, um, one thing was, I know Zero Trust, everyone calls it a buzzword. It is a buzzword, so all people are, have been talking about, or we're talking about in 2022. But I do remember one of the events I covered Tina Rodrigue with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, she said that Zero Trust was um, going to be a major focal point um, for supply chain security efforts, um, not just with that agency, but also with the Department of Education, following all of the, uh, the solar winds and the Log4j attacks. She was saying that Zero Trust really needs to become a mantra for federal agencies as far as ramping up digital product development. Anytime you upgrade or update your security, um, it's very critical. So you need to make sure that you have Zero Trust. You always, of course, verify and re-authenticate. But she said it's also important for agencies to make sure that they have a team that's trained in cybersecurity and where they're maintaining that transparency throughout the entire software lifecycle. So 
Zero Trust was and will continue to be a top priority for 2023. So ICE CISO Rob Thorne in a Cybercast interview this past year, which I believe was with you, Nikki, also Mm -hmm. talked a lot about how automation is going to play a pretty big role in Zero Trust and talked about how federal agencies need to have a more proactive instead of reactive approach to zero trust. And he also talked quite a bit about behavioral data analytics and that how that can help kind of define data-driven decisions and how to look at that from a zero trust perspective. Automation plays a huge role in your zero trust journey. Um, I don't think you can avoid it, nor I don't, nor can you be successful with zero trust if you don't have automation. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is moving towards a more proactive um, cybersecurity posture versus a, a reactive approach. Um, it's all about speed uh, now. So it's the ability to um, identify and remove uh, the threats from your environment. So the faster we can identify or isolate the threat, the less impact there is on the mission. I often will tell my folks, hey, it's okay. You know, we may we may experience a breach, but it's how we we uh, react to it and how resilient we are and how quickly we can clean clean it up, uh, and and that would mean less impact uh, to the mission. So, the best way to here to kind of talk about automation is to explain some of the stuff here that we're doing at ICE. So, for example, we're focused right now on user behavior data analytics. So this will help us make more uh, data driven decisions. We're very much um, a data-driven shop. We look at data, data tells a story, and we want it, we use it to make decisions. So again, when you look at this from a zero trust perspective, this is that adaptive or context-based a- access. Looking at the posture of the device and making decisions on what people uh, may have access to or not have access to. So in a joint episode with GSA and CISA, they talked about their new privileged identity playbook. And I don't remember who was the one who hosted this episode. Was that you, Sarah? That was me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any like takeaways off the top of your head from that episode? Because they talked quite a bit about identity management, which is the foundation for zero trust and just, you know, how to kind of iterate zero trust from that standpoint. Yeah, definitely. I think you hit the key points. I think the primary focus of this episode was identity and access management. So they created this playbook as a set of best practices for the rest of government and also non-government organizations to help them implement better security measures that focus more on privileged access without slowing down or bogging down the other security priorities they have in the pipeline. Uh, So they discussed a lot of that and how that's integrated the collaboration between GSA and CISA and how they're working with the CDM office at CISA to create a more cross-government approach to ICAM solutions. Uh, Managing your privileged users is a critical agency function because these users have an elevated access um, they, there's the potential for doing unwanted behavior that could have a significant uh, compromise on agency assets or operations. So understanding that insider risk classification um, and aligning your insider risk programs to also include privileged users is, is a major um, takeaway from the playbook. Uh, additionally, a big one that Ross and I talk about all the time is decreasing your attack surface. So if we look at uh, okay, um, privilege escalation is a major uh, attack pattern. And privilege escalation is that an adversary is able to get onto a system and then they're able to find an account and gain higher privileges to perform those security functions. So that's an example of a privilege escalation. And one of the takeaways from this playbook is that to decrease the potential for privilege escalation by identifying your privilege users and privilege accounts, uh, controlling them and managing them correctly, and then doing that on an ongoing basis. Uh, one of the one of the specific uh, takeaways from this playbook is have a privileged user champion. So agencies can choose uh, an advocate for the program so that there's one person in charge. Uh, they make sure they have executive support and that's built in as an a- enterprise-wide function to it. 
I think that pretty much wraps it up for the health and civilian side of the zero trust trend this past year. On the defense side, obviously, the biggest piece of news was the Pentagon finally releasing their five-year zero trust strategy. That was a major story towards the end of 2022 because it outlines all of the target levels of zero trust readiness that DOD wants the military service branches and all the different components for the state, et cetera, to meet by 2027. So pretty important document. It's also supposed to dovetail with the recently awarded joint war fighting cloud capability, but that's a conversation for another time. The other big development on the DOD side with regards to zero trust this past year was the Thunderdome zero trust prototype that DISA is developing with Booz Allen Hamilton. That was supposed to be finished over the summer, but then they issued a six month extension to January, 2023, so that they could develop a separate prototype for their classified network, Cipernet. So expect to hear more about that in the coming months as the prototype wraps up and as DOD starts iterating on some of these zero trust goals that they laid out at the end of the year. The other big trend this past year was definitely around culture. I feel like in a lot of our interviews with cybersecurity experts, they talked a lot about relationship building with industry, but also with other federal agencies, mainly for the information sharing aspect, which has become really important for trying to get ahead of cyber attacks, especially as ransomware has accelerated so much in the last couple of years. But the other piece of that culture aspect is really the workforce. I feel like there's been a renewed focus on, one, getting people into cyber jobs, and then two, educating people who use a computer, which is basically everyone, basically educating everyone in the workforce on basic cyber hygiene, because that's become increasingly critical as cyber attacks have not only proliferated, but also become so much more sneaky, basically. So ODNI's director of cyber threat intelligence, Laura Galante, talked about the importance of the intelligence community building partnerships with industry and how one of ODNI's missions is looking at cyber intelligence and how that can be better shared and used across cybersecurity and national security focuses. How do we have the right partnerships that allow us the agility to see what threats are coming, handle them, uh, figure out how to defend against them? And then also, how do we have the right mechanisms within the sprawling intelligence community, whether it's between FBI, CIA, NSA, um, and then CISA, you know, not part of the um, IC, but CISA sitting there under DHS is, is a critical piece to what scaling network defense looks looks like for the government and for the countries, right? So how do you have the right mechanisms and collaborative um, relationships and, and systems between the different agencies? So that's one of the things that we work on quite often. So let me give you an example of, of kind of how I think that's working really well. Over the last several years, there's been just an increased need to find ways to have relationships between a lot of the commercial cybersecurity vendors um, and technology companies who are frequently on the edge of seeing threat activity. As you and your, your audience can imagine, you know, it's someone who is on every, you know, many computers across the globe because of the software that they sell or the hardware that they provide, they're going to get a look at scale of what's hitting their own software and their client's software, potentially before the government may, right? So being able to get those indications and warnings, the canary in the coal mine, um, of what sorts of threats or new tactics that are being used, right? Um, getting, getting that insight earlier and doing it in a way that's, that's two-way, 
right? So where a tech company is able to say, here's a new tactic that, that a threat actor is using. If they're able to have a conversation um, with the intelligence community, whether it's through the Cyber Collaboration Center up at NSA, um, or whether it's with FBI investigators, if they're able to have the conversation and say, look, we're seeing this new tactic. Um, what else from, from your side, I see, might be useful in understanding how that tactic might be used, who might be behind it, what should we scale to, what is an effective way for us to mitigate this. That conversation is, is happening so much more often than it had in the past. And it's really a testament to the work that both IC agencies are doing in thinking about how you partner outside. Um, and then also how agencies are thinking, look, this is not a problem that can be solved by just increasing our collection or improving our analysis. This is about finding the right mechanisms, partners, um, use cases to really be able to have that back and forth conversation that scales some of the technical problems and, and, and mitigation measures that are needed to really improve larger cybersecurity. Sarah, I know the Department of Labor also talked about cybersecurity awareness and workforce culture. Can you talk about that a little bit? Earlier this spring, I interviewed Ali Kawar, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Employee Benefit Security. Uh, and he explained to me a new cybersecurity guidance that DOL developed over the past few years that helps keep retirement plan data secure, which is really vulnerable to different threats, including malware, ransomware, phishing, uh, because it's targeting what could be called a more vulnerable population. When you look at the older population that has less experience with technology, they're more susceptible to different scams like phishing, emails and things like that. So he explained how this guidance is helping better secure that information. What I would say is that some of the fundamentals really haven't changed um, about how to kind of try to prevent a ransom, successful ransomware attack. And really what I mean is that, um, you know, I, I kind of, again, not being a, the, the tech person, I think of ransomware as, as the consequence, not the method. And the, the, the method um, that results in a key ransomware attack is continues to be things like successful phishing attempt, an unpatched vulnerability, um, people clicking on links that they shouldn't. Um, those are, you know, those have been kind of fundamental parts of cyber hygiene for a while. And I think even with increased sophistication in what a ransomware attack or attempt looks like, uh, they continue to be uh, critically important. So thinking about like your patch management, uh, the way you're educating employees, the way you're you're testing them to make sure that they're they're remembering not to click on something, even if it offers them, you know, a five hundred dollar gift card uh, if it's from from an address that they don't recognize or outside the organization. Things like that, I think, are going to continue to be important um, and a critical part of addressing these concerns. On the defense side, Army Software Factory, CISO, Angel Fanef had a really interesting perspective on cybersecurity and culture and what DOD needs to do in order to reach zero trust readiness, especially from a culture standpoint. She said how cyber doesn't just belong to one team or a cybersecurity team. It belongs to all of us. And she has a great little quote about that that we can share. And so cyber doesn't just belong to one team, that's the cybersecurity team. It really belongs to all of us. And I think this goes beyond the technology. It's involving uh, or thinking of cyber when you're writing contracts and acquisitions to ensuring that the cyber capability support and requirements are being baked into every of the business. So, you know, our acquisition folks, our contracting folks, they kind of have to put cyber in thought when they're writing these contracts or purchasing new products. I think this is a lesson that can be applied to every software factory and every program across the DOD. So we've had zero trust and culture as two of the big trends of 2022. What's our third? So that would be ransomware. And we did a ransomware mini series last year on Cybercast 
diving into some different federal agencies' perspectives on ransomware trends and also how they're aiming to address ransomware challenges in the workplace. So we had a great interview with the FDA. And Sarah, did you want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, so uh, last year I interviewed Dr. Kevin Fu, who's the acting director of medical device cybersecurity at the FDA, Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Unfortunately, he has since left the agency, so I guess he would be uh, the former acting director today. But he explained how he's building in security to protect against ransomware threats. Uh, He said one of the most observable impacts of ransomware is the unavailability to deliver healthcare. So when you're looking at civilian agencies like HHS or VA, like that actually deliver care to the customers, ransomware affects different hospital networks. And the intent of the bad actor is to make it so healthcare professionals and clinicians can't provide care by affecting the system. He also explained that this type of malware is no longer just affecting pure information. Uh, It's also beginning to affect medical devices themselves. So he was talking about the different guidances and strategies FDA has developed to combat those threats. And an update as of late December 2022, medical device security provisions are now part of President Biden's $1.7 trillion spending bill. This requires medical device makers to meet certain cybersecurity requirements and their new product submissions to the Food and Drug Administration. So it's having that White House backing to what Dr. Fu was explaining. The sort of most observable impacts of ransomware is the uh, unavailability to deliver health. So you you see this all the time. You don't have to look too far in the news. Uh, You know, every day or every week, you'll hear of another health system uh, disrupted by ransomware getting into their, um, traditionally, their IT systems that affect um, uh, medical records and such. Now, what's changing uh, and what's sort of new here is that uh, this type of malware is no longer just affecting pure information it's also beginning to affect medical devices themselves. So for example, last year, uh, in April of last year, there was a uh, radiation oncology product that because of some downstream effects of ransomware remediation, the manufacturer's cloud became unavailable and the radiation therapy devices depended upon this cloud in order to deliver its uh, therapies. And so uh, these devices were unavailable to deliver patient care for weeks uh, because of this ransomware. So it's no longer theoretical. um, And uh, rescheduling radiation therapy uh, is not as simple as rescheduling a haircut. Uh, There are um, extremely important uh, timing sensitivity for uh, regular dosage. Uh, These are highly utilized devices. It's very difficult. Uh, It's not just an annoyance. This is putting patients uh, at risk uh, when these devices are not available uh, as intended. So uh, delayed patient care uh, is a big problem uh, when it comes to ransomware. Um, Now, ransomware, in my opinion, uh, is more of a a symptom than a problem. It it really speaks to uh, subtle security flaws deeply baked into Uh, a lot of the uh, healthcare system. Uh, In my opinion, these devices should be able to resist ransomware, but it's clear when ransomware disrupts healthcare or a medical device, um, something went awry in in the early medical device design uh, with the threat modeling for, for uh, for the medical device. So to close out our ransomware mini series last year, I interviewed CISA's National Risk Management Center Assistant Director, Mona Harrington, and she was able to give a nice overview of ransomware trends. And one of the big ones that I thought was really interesting that I hadn't heard a whole lot about was the trend of triple and double extortion. The idea of triple extortion is to not only deny access to your data and force you to pay a ransom in order to regain that access, but also blackmail the victim 
and threaten to tell their suppliers or leak sensitive information to their suppliers or partners or shareholders or their competitors. Or you can issue threats to leak sensitive data to the general public that you wouldn't want out there or that your customers wouldn't want out there. So it's basically like this very like complex blackmail sort of scenario where they're basically hitting you like from every angle that they can to get as much money out of you as they can. So that was a really interesting trend to learn about. And I know the FBI talked about this a little bit as well. And you've covered the FBI quite a bit from a cybersecurity perspective, Nikki. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. Encryption has been something that is of course, really been um, in the news a lot lately. And FBI Cyber Section Chief Brian Smith uh, talked about it and talked about how historically they're housed within governments and it wasn't really made available to the uh, public, but now not so much. And it is being, encryption is being used for ransomware. And I know that even the OMB has issued uh, memos regarding encryption and how important it is for agencies to take steps to prevent malware and ransomware. So it's just a really um, big problem right now. But hopefully over time, agencies will take the steps that they need to and that they are required to, to uh, prevent malware and ransomware. Encryption capabilities were historically housed within governments, and so that wasn't available to the public. But as that has become more commonplace, certainly is now being used for the ransomware. But it's also the encryption that they utilize uh, to hide their files um, and executables for antivirus software. It's the encryption that they utilize in their communications platforms which provides another layer of difficulty for law enforcement to go after these actors and to see the activity that they're engaging in. And actually, there is one last thing, and you alluded to it, is then the groups getting together, I think as you phrased it, they have followed the Western model of commerce and have specialized in their activities. And so early on, you may have had the same person who's responsible for developing the malware, delivering the malware, and then the money laundering that they needed to do to take the, the Bitcoin that they had extracted out and then convert that into fiat currency is now they're outsourcing those things. And so that has grown in the affiliate model where you just get certain individuals who are just focused on gaining access to entities, selling that access. And so you have specialized skill sets that they're bringing to the fight. Um, to target each individual victim. This episode is brought to you by Rubrik. Data security is the new frontier in cybersecurity. For federal agencies, this means implementing a cloud-smart approach to data management without adding complexity. Rubrik can help your agency protect your data from cyber threats by using enhanced analytics and mitigating sensitive data exposure. Rubrik protects your data wherever it lives, across enterprise, cloud, and SaaS, so you can become unstoppable. At Rubrik, our mission is to let you focus on yours. Visit rubrik.com federal for more information. So zero trust, culture, and ransomware are the trends that defined 2022. Kate, Sarah, and Nikki, can we expect to see these trends in 2023? What do you think are going to be the cyber trends to look out for in the coming year? From the defense IT side, zero trust is still going to be a pretty big trend, again, because of that five-year strategy that was just released. So I think this coming year, we're going to see a lot of commentary on how to implement that strategy and what the services and components are doing to take those first steps towards target level zero trust readiness. So that's going to be a big one. Also, the Thunderdome prototype is supposed to wrap up at the end of the month. So hopefully we'll be getting an update soon on that. And I'm sure that will also inform the general cybersecurity conversation across DOD throughout the year. The other big cyber trend I expect from the defense side is hybrid cloud security, 
in general, because the joint war fighting cloud capability was just awarded and DISA has several cloud security oriented initiatives going on right now. And all of these cloud initiatives are supposed to work together to provide this holistic kind of approach to DOD cloud, which is going to be critical for JADC2. So securing all of that is obviously going to be very, very important. So cloud modernization is a big trend for all of DOD right now. And securing those cloud efforts is going to be top of mind. So I think that's going to be a big trend. And then the final one I would say from the defense side is user experience. And this was talked a little bit about last year, but I think that's going to come more to the forefront this year, especially with the JWCC just being awarded and cloud and hybrid cloud efforts really ramping up this year. It's all about user experience and improving the end user experience so that they can access the data that they need when they need it and they can do it securely without cybersecurity being something that's holding them back or creating hangups and causing problems like shadow IT. So I think that's going to be the other big cyber trend from the DoD side. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so in terms of VA, I'll start with keep an eye out for updates on the Zero Trust for Cybersecurity Strategy. Uh, This is something that the Office of Information and Technology at VA has really been driving, and CIO Kurt Delbene has alluded to different roadmaps for implementing Zero Trust along with using a Zero Trust scorecard uh, moving forward. Uh, Next, I would say keep an eye out for special salary rates that will Hopefully, it's still in uh, the process, but VA is hopeful that OPM will approve a special salary rate for tech and cyber professionals to make agency positions more competitive with industry. Also, keep an eye out for new hiring authorities for tech professionals at VA as well. Also... Now that VA has the authorities to process PACT Act claims, I'd look out for how they're going to secure the systems and benefits delivered with the influx of claims and combat against different spammers or uh, cybersecurity threats. In a separate interview with Zach Goldfein at VA and Ali Emerson at the Cybercrime Support Network, uh, they discussed how spammers and bad actors are targeting veterans that are eligible for PACT Act claims as a money grab, essentially, like convincing them that they are the VA and telling them to fill out these forms with uh, their personal information so that they can take advantage of the money that's coming from that law. And then lastly, I will touch on FDA. So FDA recently released at the end of last year its Cybersecurity Modernization Action Plan. This is adds to the plethora of action plans they have announced since 2019. So the CMAP, as they call it, outlines the measures that FDA will take to modernize its security and cyber defenses. Uh, So during the pandemic, FDA faced a huge influx of cybersecurity threats. So to combat the rising threat, FDA will advance an agency-wide approach to cybersecurity modernization built on zero trust principles. So the new action plan is designed to build on the progress made from the previous action plans, technology, data, and enterprise. And I look forward to seeing how that evolves in the new year. Nikki, what's your outlook for 2023? There are several things that I think will be top of mind for health and civilian agencies, as well as DHS uh, for 2023, one being the whole uh, operational collaboration with industry and government partners. I think that that will be a main focus. It's important to build those relationships and partnerships and everyone being on the same page, uh, especially as far as uh, cybersecurity is concerned. I know agencies like CISA are focusing on, um, they have a joint cyber defense collaborative or JCDC, and it's kind of bringing together people from industry and government agencies together and to assess like the risks in the cyber ecosystem. 
and assessing uh, or getting better visibility into like the threat landscape. Um, so everyone can analyze and share uh, cyber information. And so besides the partnerships and relationships, building a workforce uh, will also be top of mind. I know in particular, CISA is um, their strategic plan for 2023 through 2025 was released last fall. And one of their priorities is to um, unify the agency through its workforce. So they have a new budget and they plan to um, invest more in their people and uh, build a culture of excellence. As far as like health and civilian agencies, I know the FBI, uh, a major priority for them uh, for 2023 is recruiting and retaining cyber talent. It's so uh, very difficult to find these days. And so they're building um, these model uh, cyber squads, uh, they call them, in their regional offices and trying to get people who have a, um, a universal type of tech talent where they can uh, tackle any type of uh, cyber issue. And they also have this program called a Cyber Talent Initiative, where they're looking um, for, for the workforce they already have to expand the pay and uh, provide, I guess, more of ability to have retention bonuses. And they're also trying to change the culture. A lot of times people will leave the FBI, and many times um, there's issues with them coming back. So they will, are encouraging people to come back to the FBI um, from the private sector. There's another thing that they're um, trying to really put a lot of emphasis on, that's the Accelerated Cyber Training Program. It's comprised of several um, training courses, technical training courses, but the idea is to train a brand new person to cyber, then move them to the ongoing intermediate training, and then advanced training, where they can become a part of a, a cyber active team that deploys anywhere. So I think cyber talent workforce and uh, the partnerships will be um, just be a, a major or major priorities for health and civilian agencies and uh, DHS uh, for 2023. Thank you, Kate, Sarah, and Nikki. Cyber threats aren't going away and 2023 will probably see its fair share of incidents but trends such as those discussed in today's episode are paving the way to a more secure future. Keep up with the story of tomorrow by subscribing to Cybercast, where you'll find continued coverage of everything federal cybersecurity. Before we wrap up this episode, we have talked a lot about tech, but it's important to keep in mind the people behind these initiatives, which is why I wanted to end this episode by talking about Chris Inglis, the first national cyber director who is leaving his post. We were lucky enough to talk with him back in January of 2022, which was our first Cybercast episode of 2022. Kate, any thoughts on your conversation? Yeah, so we're very sad that Chris Inglis is leaving his post as the national cyber director, but they have a great team now and they're doing a lot of great stuff. So really excited to see what the office of the national cyber director is going to do in 2023. Our episode with Chris from January, 2022, I feel like really kind of set the stage for 2022 in terms of cyber, because it was very focused on one partnerships and relationship building, which we've talked a lot about today in this episode. And that was one of the big trends for 2022. But he also talked about the importance of information sharing, which I feel like also, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand with the relationship building aspect. But especially when it comes to cybersecurity, keeping people updated on what you're seeing in the cyber landscape and also notifying the necessary parties as soon as you have been hacked or you think you've been hacked is so important. And it's something that CISA has stressed a lot too. And, you know, last year we got the cyber incident reporting mandate. So that was a big thing along those lines. CISA Director Jen Easterly said cyber defense is the new offense, and 
in order to be good cyber defenders, we have to talk to each other. And that was also a really big story. So, you know, I really think that that episode really does set the tone for cybersecurity coverage in 2022. And I think it's going to set the tone for 2023 as well. Like it's really going to come down to culture and information sharing, I think, and cybersecurity this year. Culture and information sharing, a good note to leave on. We'll be back in two weeks with a new interview, but I think we should let Chris Inglis have the last word. I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Kate Macri. I'm Sarah Seibert. I'm Nikki Henderson. Thank you for listening. The good news here is that I think that there is a sea state change in, in kind of broadly, both users and, and leaders um, who are accountable for missions, understanding that this is an issue, that there's something going on here, um, that there's a cyber challenge, a cyber problem. And the bad news is, is that in, in far too many cases, uh, there's still an assumption that it's somebody else's problem to solve, that there are champions who have the word cyber or IT in their job title, that it's their problem alone to solve. And that's, I think, what we need to challenge, which is actually this is everyone's challenge or everyone's opportunity, um, that every individual user can take actions to help in their own defense, that every organization can take actions in how they build and operate this digital infrastructure that makes it more likely that a transgressor is going to have to get past resilience and robustness or get past an alert kind of population, not just the folks with cyber IT in their job title. Um, and to your point about whether we have cyber on the back burner or the front burner, we need to understand that cyber doesn't exist for its own sake. The only reason that we care about cyber, the principal reason we care about cyber, is so that we can then achieve the mission, the, the functions, the responsibilities that we built this system for in the first place. Um, a colleague um, in the private sector, a fellow by the name of Jeff Moss, um, told me something a few months ago that I found, you know, wonderfully insightful. He asked the question, he said, why do race cars have bigger brakes? Paused and was trying to think my way through what was something other than the obvious answer. And he goes, they have bigger brakes so they can go faster. He said, they don't have bigger brakes for the brakes sake. They have bigger brakes so that the mission of the race car can be achieved. We need to think of cyber in the same way. The only reason we do cyber is so that we can achieve our end mission. So when we ask someone who's in the IT or the cyber field, what do you do? They shouldn't say, I defend digital infrastructure, I defend software, I defend hardware. They should say, I defend missions. Cybercast, along with GovCast and HealthCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. <laughs>